welcome to Rye Hill Baptist Church for Wednesday evening, October 5th, 2022. This evening's message is brought to us by Senior Pastor Michael Franklin and is taken from the book of John, chapter 13, verses 1 through 17, and is titled, Serving Others. Enjoy. you have your Bibles, uh, would you turn with me to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. It's good to see everybody here tonight and hate to break up the good fellowship, but there's still time afterwards uh, where you can fellowship. Tonight I want to talk to you on the, sur- on the subject of serving others. Serving Others, John chapter 13. And let me go ahead and give you the outline. Number one, Jesus' unusual action. Jesus' unusual action. Number two, Peter's usual action. Okay, Peter's usual action. And number three, Jesus' teaching lesson. Jesus' teaching lesson. John chapter 13. You know, in John, John 13 begins Jesus' farewell message to his disciples. There were four relationships that Jesus wanted to talk about as he was telling them once again that his time was coming when he would go back to heaven and be with his heavenly Father. The four relationships are God, Simon Peter, Judas, and the disciples. Jesus did a surprising action when he began to wash the disciples' feet. It was an object lesson that they never would forget, especially Peter. Jesus' point was that true love isn't a feeling. True love, true agape love, is an attitude, and it is an action. So let's look at serving others from John chapter 13. Jesus' unusual action. Now, before the Feast of the Passover, and we all know what that was, uh, it was a huge time. There were, I mean, literally thousands of people in Jerusalem. When he knew that his hour had come, and folks, uh, several times you see in the Gospels uh, that Jesus would tell them, my hour has not come yet. And of course, he was talking about the cross, he was talking about the crucifixion, and he was talking about his death. And it says, Jesus knew that his hour had not come, that he should depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. I think it's interesting that John makes uh, this this statement here. uh, And and again, John had a special relationship with Jesus. Uh, He was part of the inner three there, uh, Peter, James, and John. And uh, here he was saying, having loved his own, he was talking about all of the disciples. One thing that really sticks out in this scripture uh, to me was Judas. Okay, Jesus knew what Judas was going to do. Jesus knew when Judas was going to do this. But yet, he never pointed him out. And when I say pointed him out tonight, uh, he was revealing that, but he, he treated him like he did the other ones. And I truly believe, uh, you know, uh, all the disciples knew how much Jesus had loved them. And you think of some of the things that they did, and uh, especially Peter. You know, Peter was always talking first. Uh, many times he would put his foot in his mouth. Uh, many times uh, when you read through the Gospels, you would think, you know, what was Peter thinking? But even with the faults of the disciples, and how many times in the Gospels did Jesus ask them, where's your faith? You, you know, you, you need to have faith. But yet Jesus just loved them to the end. I mean, and, and when, I, when I say to the end, I'm talking about until he died, until he passed away. Uh, he had a special relationship with the disciples. Now verse 2, and supper being ended, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to 
betray him. And again, there were people that just thought that, you know, Judas didn't have a choice. I got news for you folks. God always gives mankind a choice. And he could have changed. It could have been another person or a different person. But when it says the devil had already put it into his heart, he is simply saying that Judas had already made up his mind. And folks, I'm telling you, uh, you know, he crossed that threshold. He crossed that line to where there was no return. Because, again, we knew uh, he was going to betray him for 30 pieces of silver. Then verse 3, And Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, and that he had come from God, and he was going to God, rose up from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. And I'm telling you, when Jesus started this process, I'm sure the disciples were like, what is he doing? Because you have to understand the Jewish culture, okay? The only person in that house that would be doing this, not even a Jewish a servant would do that. It was reserved only for the slaves. And he said, and, and they, they knew what he was going to do. He was going to wash the disciples' feet. And when you think about that, you, can, you just think about how humble Jesus was. Folks, we're talking about the Son of God. We're talking about the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We're talking about dirt, filth. And back in those days, there weren't paved highways, folks. It was dust. It was dirt. And one of the things uh, that, that happened before supper, uh, you know, uh, they would get the slave and usually it was a Gentile also. And they would get that, uh, the slave girl uh, or the slave man to wash people's feet. So you could imagine, you know, you know how the disciples were. They were just probably whispering and doing like this. What is he doing? This is totally out of the ordinary. I promise you it totally caught them by surprise. And then verse 5, and after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So I don't know, uh, you know, if it was just people didn't, the disciples didn't know what to say, but it doesn't indicate there was much conversation going on. Not much at all. But he, but he took each one of them, them and they were, and he was washing their feet. And again, folks, that included Judas, which shows just a humble act. And uh, it, was a, it was a loving act on Jesus' part. Look at Luke chapter 9 with me. Look at Luke 9. Luke 9, verse 46. The Bible says in Luke 9, 46, and then a dispute arose among them uh, to which of them would be the greatest. <laughs> and again, it, it's just kind of men talk. All right, they're going down the road and, you know, they're just, you know, fellowshipping with one another. And, you know, it's kind of like, man, I've done more than you. Man, Jesus likes me more than you. You know, these things are going on and, and this conversation is going on like that. And Jesus perceived the thought of their heart and took a little child and set him by him. And, and if you look at the gospel, folks, Jesus used object lessons all the time, okay? Object lessons of, of you know, the, the, what I've already said about the, the towel and the washing and, and the feet washing and all that was going on. And you look all through the gospels, he, he was showing them object lessons. And then he said, Unto them, whoever receives this little child in my name receives me. What was he saying? Folks, Jesus loved everyone. Jesus loved the children. And they're bragging on, you know, who's going to be the greatest. Uh, later on, you know, John, James and John's mom even asked, would you let one of them set to the right of you and let one of them set to the left of you? And Jesus said, listen, 
You know, there are no special places. You know, there's nobody humanly above somebody else, okay? And then it says, uh, receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. And then he made this statement, for he who is the least among you all will be great. Well, why did he use a child? Because in those days, do you know what, children? They were supposed to be seen and not heard. You ever go to a family reunion or go to a family thing, and right before you get out of the car, don't you embarrass me in front of the family. Don't you pop off. Don't, I don't care what that crazy Uncle Bob of yours does. Don't take the bait. You just be quiet. Okay, and again, I'm not talking about our days now. I'm talking about, you know, we were in Amarillo, Texas, and there was a, a reunion, and that was exactly what my dad told me when I got out of the car. All right? And he was simply saying, these kids are important to me. Everyone, every human being is important to me. And you are no better than anyone else. Jesus made it plain, okay, what was going on there. And he told them, for, for who is the least among you will be great. Then look at Matthew 23. Matthew 23. Because our idea of greatness is finishing first. Our idea of greatness is being in the spotlight. Our idea of greatness is getting the respect of everyone around us. Our idea of greatness is how much money we make. And Jesus said, listen, you need to learn from this child, okay? This child depends on me, and, and you depend on me also. You are no greater than this little child. And then in Matthew Chapter 23, look at verse 11. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. This is Jesus' words. And Jesus humbled himself that night, okay, that night, and he, he humbled himself and he took on the form of, of a servant, not just a servant, a slave, folks. And he showed, <clears throat> excuse me, the disciples how much he loved them. I believe when this thing started, it was quiet as can be. So we see Jesus' unusual action, and we see Peter's usual action. I mean, here we go, verse 6. Then he came to Simon Peter. And Peter said unto him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Well, that's a dumb question. I mean, you think about it. He is. He, he, I don't know the order that they went in, but I just, I just know. I do believe Judas was probably towards the first of all that was going on. Because, again, you have, to, you have to realize Jesus knew what was going to happen. Jesus knew when he got to Peter there was something going to happen. And he says, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? You know what he's really saying? Why are you washing my feet? Okay, why? You, you, before I let you, before I allow you to do this, you have to tell me why. And folks, let me ask you something, and it's a rhetorical question. Does God owe you an explanation about anything? Think about it. Does God owe you an explanation? Folks, there's a lot of things that God does that I either don't understand or I don't see it the way God sees it. Folks, he doesn't owe Peter an explanation, all right? In verse 7, And Jesus answered and said in him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. And there's two, uh, what I believe, uh, you know, emphasis in what he's talking about. After this, Number one is when all this is done. When, when, I, when I get to the end of this, you're going to figure it out. But I also think he means later on in life, when I leave this place, you will apply it to your life. Right now, you don't get it. All right? You're jumping, jumping to conclusions, uh, which is a lot of what Peter did. And then verse 8 said, And Peter said in him, You shall never wash my feet. And folks, I've learned a long time ago, never is not a good thing to say about a lot of things. Because even in our relationship with God, I'll never go to Africa. I'll never, you know, 
and you can just fill in the blank. All right? Matter of fact, when I surrendered to the ministry, I surrendered to the youth ministry. And my thought when I was talking to the, to the preacher about this, as long as I don't have to preach, I can be in the ministry. That's what I told the pastor. Well, you don't have to preach. Just be a youth minister. Okay? Folks, never say never. All right? Jesus knew what he was doing. Jesus knew Peter's thought process. And he was just being stubborn. One was stubbornness. And I tell you what the other thing is, is pride. What's the opposite of humility? It's pride. Peter had much pride. Jesus was showing him humility. And it's obvious that Peter did not learn his lesson even down the road. I'm telling you, the rooster's going to crow three times and you're going to deny me three times. And the, verse, the rest of that is, Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash, your, uh, wash you, you have no part with me. What was he saying? He's saying, listen, you know, this is not an option. Okay, if you're going to be my disciple, if you're going to understand what I'm trying to tell you, you need to do what I ask you to do. Peter was being just, you know, uh, his attitude was not right. Peter was in some ways rebuking Jesus himself. You may, you may do these other 11, but you're not doing me. I'm telling you right now. Peter had a terrible attitude about what was going on. And Jesus answered him. And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but my, also my hands and my head. Now, is that not Peter's normal actions? I mean, three times Jesus said, I want to do this. I need to do this. You need to let me do this. And he even popped off. I think it's just being smart aleck. He popped off to Jesus and said, well, if you're going to get my feet, why don't you just get my whole body? Okay? And then Jesus said to him, he who's, who uh, is bathed needs to only wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. Now, I've heard this explained in a lot of ways, but I am just telling you, Monday, when I wrote this in my study back here, it was as if a light came on on this issue. Okay, and again, this is my opinion, but I'm just telling you, a light came on. What he basically is saying, and what I think he's referring to, is salvation. When we get saved, we are cleansed. Every sin is forgiven. We start over. All is forgiven. Every sin that we ever committed, we are cleansed. We are clean from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet. Salvation cleanses all of us. But think about feet in those days. What is he comparing that to? He's talking about your walk with the Lord. And he is saying, I believe this is what Jesus is saying. He is saying, Peter, you're already clean. You're already saved. That's not what I'm talking about. The foot washing is we get in this world and we walk down these roads and we do things that we're not supposed to do. And we get dirty again. It's not that we're not saved. It's just that our feet need washing. We need to recognize and confess our sins. We need to get that mud and dirt and that grime off of our feet, in our actions, in our attitudes, in our thoughts. And that's what he was saying. Jesus was trying to tell him, Peter, you don't get it. Okay? And, and you think about that. What was he preparing him for? He was preparing him to lead the New Testament church. He was already a leader of the disciples, but that's only, it, it's only 11 people. He was getting him ready. Peter, you have a great responsibility. And the reason I'm roasting the feet, because folks, every day, let me ask you this. Do you not get in the shower? Every, I hope you get in the shower or take a bath every day. We should. Why? Because we're dirty. And that's what he's saying. He's saying, Peter, 
you, you're not even figuring this deal out. And then he proves this in verse 11. For he who knew who he would betray him, therefore he said, you are not all clean. What was he talking about? He's talking about Judas. Okay? Judas had not been saved. Judas, and folks, it just, I never have understood how a guy can spend three and a half years or three years with Jesus and not get saved. But it's still a choice. Folks, you can, go, you can come to church, but that doesn't make you saved. You can go through the baptismal waters. That doesn't make you. can be a member of a church and not be saved. Je, Jesus was telling, and that's what he was trying to say to Peter. And this statement was for both of them. It was for Peter. Peter, <laughs> you, you believe me, your feet need washing. <laughs> what I was thinking is, Peter, your mouth needs washing too. Matter of fact, I got where I kind of got used to ivory soap when I was a child. You know, when they put, moms used to put the soap in your mouth, I got to where, eh, that's not that bad. And, when, and that's kind of the way Peter was, folks. He was saying, Peter, you do need, your feet need to be washed because you're, you're not being humble. You're being rude, really. You got pride. You are not a humble man. Sit there and let me wash your feet. And then he shot this message to Judas. And I believe that was his last. I mean, I understand Satan had already entered, him, entered into him, but I still think Jesus was telling him, Judas, I know you're not saved. You haven't been clean. And then later on, of course, we know he said, hey, go and do what you have to do. Now, again, Mark 8, Mark 8, this is not the first time Jesus gets on uh, Peter. Mark chapter 8, verse 31. You talk about bold and sticking your foot in your mouth. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer. Mark 8, 31. Many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days he will arise again. And he spoke this word openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. <laughs> what a... What a what a, I don't even know what to say. The word hose head comes to me. What a <laughs> rebuking Jesus himself. That, that, is, that is crazy. Verse 33, but when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter saying, get thee behind me, Satan. Now he wasn't calling Peter Satan. He was saying, Satan is influencing you. Folks, I'm telling you, that's Satan's job, to influence us, to get us to pop off or to get us to do something wrong, to take our eyes off of Jesus, to not be humble, to be full of pride in these things. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of man. And even in that, I mean, if you want to even try to spiritualize it, Peter was just saying, no, you know, they're not going, they're not getting to you. They got to come through me first. <laughs> well, folks, that's exactly what they did. Okay? I mean, the disciples took tail and they ran. But, G but Peter rebuked Jesus. Oh, folks, I, I, I would not suggest that. It is not smart at all. So, Jesus' unusual action. Peter's usual action, and Jesus' is teaching lesson. Look at verse 12. So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and sat down again, and remember, when he sat down, that is a teaching, a rabbi, a teacher taught sitting down. And he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say well for me. And again, uh, there is no doubt Jesus uh, was one of the best teachers that ever walked the face of the earth. I mean, he had the mind of Christ. He had God uh, with him. Uh, he always said, thus saith the Lord. Uh, he was a respected teacher. There were many, even the scribes and Pharisees. You know, who is this guy? Where did he get his education? You call me teacher and Lord, and Lord, folks, is Savior. Lord is the Messiah. You call me that, and I am. Verse 14, 
if then your Lord and teacher, do you notice how he reversed that? He said teacher and Lord, and now he reverses that. I had, I had not caught that before. If you then, uh, your Lord and your teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. What he's saying is, listen, if I, he, he's saying, I am Lord. Folks, he was the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And if I see the need and the necessity and a great reason to wash people's feet, you need to do it too. You need to do it too. I will say I have been invited to a couple of foot washing. It wasn't Southern Baptist. And uh, again, I'm not saying one way or the other. I've ne never felt led to go to one. I have never, I'm not against it. If that's what somebody wants to do, you can do that. But Jesus is simply saying, if you say I'm Lord, if you say I'm your teacher, you need to emulate me. You need to emulate me. And, and again, that's where the object lesson is. I don't think the, you know, there's no saving value to a feet washing. There's good illustrations. I, I think it's a great illustration of serving others. I think it's a fantastic illustration of serving others. Because I guarantee you there are people in this church and in probably every church that say, I ain't touching nobody's feet. Okay? And again, you know, you can put rubber gloves on and you can do it sanitarily. But I'm just telling you, there are people that will, they would not do that. It doesn't matter what is said. And then verse 15, for I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. See, you know, we have these so-called superheroes of athletics, Michael Jordan. Uh, LeBron James, and you just and you can go back into you know the 1950s and and grab a lot of folks uh, as far as athletically, but I guarantee you, folks, uh, we don't need to emulate them. I'm I, again. I I Lori read to me last night a thing about Aaron Judd, about his beginning, about him being adopted, and his mother. Uh, was really thinking about abortion. You need to get on there and read about that. That was an amazing story. And he's a Christian. He's a believer. And folks, those are the people, not that we need to admire, but those are the people we need to look up to. There is only one person we need to emulate, and that is Jesus Christ, our Lord. He is the only perfect person. And he said, I'm giving you an example. And folks, it's not, and I hope we know this, it's not just foot washing, folks. All right, that's, that's just the object lesson part of it. It's serving others. It's serving others. Because in our society, people that serve others tend to look, be looked down upon. While Jesus says, hey, you, you don't need to worry about the applaud of men. You don't need to worry about impressing men. You need to worry, and not worry is the thing. You need to do what Jesus would do, okay? Do what Jesus would do. And just, you know, I, I was thinking Saturday as we was going down the ditches and we were picking up, man, there's a lot of beer bottles and a lot of cans there. And there were several cars and trucks that stopped and said, Thank you for doing what you're doing. And folks, there are a lot of people that wouldn't get down in that ditch, and I'm not bragging on us or who came. I'm simply saying we were Jesus' hands and we were Jesus' feet. We had our shirts on, and we were saying we care about our community. We care about what's going on down here. And the foot wash, it's no different, folks, from foot washing. It's no different. And that's what he's saying. Verse 16, most assuredly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. And not only was that, and I shared this story uh, Sunday night, I not only was blessed by people stopping by and thanking us, but for the sheriff to say, you know what, I've heard some good things about your church. And he says, 
we have to drive clear across town to church. He says, we're going to try your, my family and I are going to try your church sometime. Folks, that's what foot washing is. That's what it's about. It's about serving. It's about not, not getting recognized for it. We need to be humble in our service. We need to do it out of love. Love for God. Love for our community. Love for our church. Love for our church. By the way, if there's that many people drinking and making that corner, who, and this is not a political statement, who in their right minds thinks making recreational marijuana is going to be okay in our society? Who, who in their right mind thinks that is okay? Okay? Matthew 25. Matthew 25. Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, and he will, then He will sit on the throne of His glory and all the nations will be gathered before Him. And He will separate them uh, from another, the shepherd that divides the sheep from the, sheep from the goats. And He will set uh, the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on His left. Then the king will say to those in His right hand, Come, you blessed of my Father, and inherit the kingdom of heaven prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you as a stranger and take you in or clothe you? Or when did we see you sick and in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. We will be rewarded for the things that we do. But notice the reactions, the reaction there. Well, when did we do that? We were just doing the right thing. We were just trying to minister people. We were just trying to love on people. We were just trying to show people who Jesus really is. They didn't even realize what they were doing was doing what Jesus would do. See, Jesus' love, while he was here, always had actions, you know, with it. He didn't just talk about love. He was love. He showed love. He showed how much he loves mankind. Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you for this story. And God, just thank you that, uh, Lord, you have taught us that we need to be serving others. God, it's not about us. It's about you. It's about your ministry. It's about your church. It's about people hurting. It's about loving the unlovable. It's about doing what you would do. God, I pray that we would remember what would Jesus do. And God, I pray that we would do it every time. Love is an action work. Love is an attitude. God, I pray that we would have the attitude that you have. And if we need to get our hands dirty, I pray that we would do that. If we could reach one soul for you getting our hands dirty, Lord, it would be worth it all. Oh, God, we love you. We thank you. We praise you for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We thank you for joining us this evening at Rye Hill Baptist Church. And may God richly bless you.